Hello and good morning. My name is Francine Harrigan. I'm with the United Nations Department of Public Information. We're very pleased to have you join us today for the launch of the United Nations World Economic Situation and Prospects as of mid-2017 report. Today, to tell us about the report, I'm very pleased to welcome Diana Alacon, Chief Global Economic Monitoring Unit, Development Policy and Analysis Division, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And to my far left, Dawn Holland, Senior Economic Affairs Officer, Global Economic Monitoring Unit, Development Policy Analysis Division, again, UN DESA. And with that, Diana, let me turn the floor to you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here to the launch of the World Economic Situation and Prospects as of mid-2017. Well, uh, thank you for joining us for a discussion on the state of the world economy as of mid-2017. The report presented today updates forecasts from the UN flagship publication World Economic Situation and Prospects 2017, which was released in January. The report confirms that at the global level, economic growth has strengthened in recent months in line with the forecast presented in January. Industrial production has picked up, world trade is reviving, and economic sentiment has generally improved. World gross product is expected to expand by 2.7% in 2017 and 2.9% 2 in 2018, unchanged from the previous forecast. However, the modest strengthening of economic activity has not been evenly spread across countries we are seeing a general uptick in growth in many of the large developed countries, improved prospects in many economies in transition, and continued robust growth in East and South Asia. However, the strength of recovery remains insufficient in many regions for rapid progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. For example, Average incomes in several parts of Africa and in South America actually declined last year and are projected to increase only slightly in 2017 and 2018. Of particular concern is the deterioration of prospects for some of the world's poorest countries. Average GDP growth projections for many of the least developed countries have been revised downward. GDP for this group as a whole is expected to rise by just 4.7% in 2017 and 5.3% in 2018. This is significantly below the SDG target of at least 7%. The report warns that under the current growth trajectory, without a decline in income inequality, nearly 35% of the population in least developed countries may remain in extreme poverty by 2030. Ending poverty in all its forms in the current economic environment will require countries to tackle inequality issues more rigorously, including commitments to share prosperity both within and across national borders. The report also highlights the high degree of uncertainty in the international policy environment, which continues to cloud the outlook and heightens uncertainty around prospects for world trade, development aid, and climate targets. We aim to realize a world where every country enjoys sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth and decent work for all. To meet these, ambitions, these ambitious goals, countries will need to re reinvigorate global commitments to international policy coordination to achieve a balanced and sustained revival of global growth, ensuring that no regions are left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Francine. Um, so just to review some of the details um, underpinning um, the uh, World Economic Outlook report that we present today. Um, as mentioned, we have seen an onset of a modest strengthening of the global economy, which um, uh, kicked in about November last year um, and has continued into the first months of 2017. And this was in line with the forecasts that we released last January, so it's not a surprise. Um, the world economy seems to be evolving as anticipated. So we continue to forecast um, world GDP gross product growth of 2.7% for this year and 2.9% for 2018. Although, as we highlighted in January, these rates of growth still remain well below the average um, growth rates um, prior to the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Um, more concern is that we've seen a slight shift in the distribution of growth. Um, and forecasts for some of the world's poorest countries have actually been revised down since January. And as mentioned, um, in the least developed countries, we're forecasting growth of just 4.7% for this year. That compares to the Sustainable Development Goal target of 7%. Um, we aim for such a high rate of growth in order to allow faster uh, progress towards improving living standards and um, towards achieving the sustainable development goals. And our concern is that the rates of growth that we are seeing, not just in the least developed countries, but in several regions, remain below what is needed to make that rapid progress. Um, in the uh, world produc um, gross production uh, and world trade both slowed to their slowest level since um, the financial crisis last year. And we have seen um, the uptick in growth since then. So world trade has begun to rebound, and that's been driven particularly by rising demand from East Asia. So in the chart, we see the contribution from the uh, region in red, very large contribution in uh, import demand coming from the emerging Asian economies. Um, um, the more, some further detail on regional developments, we've seen firmer growth in many developed economies and have slightly revised up forecasts for both the United States and for Japan. Economies in transition are also on a slightly stronger footing um, with the, down t the uh, decline in output in the Russian Federation was uh, smaller than had been expected last year. Um, and we see a slight, uh, uh, so the slight rise in the oil price and also some structural adjustment in production, um, which is uh, rebalancing away from imports towards domestic production in several of the energy exporters. Um, East Asia and South Asia we highlight as remaining the two most uh, dynamic regions of the world economy, with East Asia expected to expand by 5.6% this year and South Asia by 6.7%. Latin, and Ameri Latin America and the Caribbean and South America in particular are recovering more slowly than had been anticipated. So we've slightly revised down the prospects um, for that region, which as a whole is expected to grow by just over 1% this year. Um, and forecasts for Africa have also been revised down, forecasting growth for the continent as a whole of 2.9% in 2017. Although we have seen some rise in uh, commodity prices, um, which is benefiting the many commodity exporting countries in the region, this has been largely overshadowed by domestic and regional pressures, um, for example, related to, uh, to conflict, to security concerns, and also to weather pressures through drought, um, which have impacted uh, many countries in the continent. Um, as just to reiterate um, regarding progress towards the uh, sustainable development goals, last year we actually saw average incomes uh, decline. Um, so the bar is pointing downward. 
West, Central, Southern Africa, and also Latin America and the Caribbean regions all saw average incomes decline. So rather than progressing towards the sustainable de development goals, we've actually took a step back last year. And for most of those regions, we're expecting only minimal growth in GDP per capita um, this year and next. So in the short term, the, the progress that can be expected in many of these regions remains very limited. Um, and that we also raise the, um, the longer term implications of that. If we don't see um, a, an uptick in growth in many of these countries, um, the, the targeting um, zero extreme poverty by 2030 is going to remain a target that is extremely difficult to reach. Our projections uh, for poverty headcount ratios in the least developed countries suggest that without a, a, a more rapid GDP growth and without redressing uh, income inequalities, we may still see 35% of the population in these countries in extreme poverty by 2030. Um, and countries, the highly uh, indebted poor countries and those in fragile or conflict situations are particularly vulnerable. Um, in the, we also raised some shorter term uh, concerns related to poverty, um, in particular high food prices um, which are impacting 26 countries around the world of which two thirds are in Africa. Um, which in, uh, has a disproportionately um, uh, negative impact on the poorest households um, in, uh, in those countries. Um, and also, of course, highlight the uh, fact that uh, uh, South Sudan is, is already declared famine and several and other countries are at high risk of famine or food insecurity. Clearly, um, uh, we're looking at uh, deepening inequalities both within and across countries in the very short term. Um, the report also highlights some more positive elements um, in terms of the environmental targets. We've seen the level of global carbon emissions stall for three consecutive years in a row now, despite the fact that the global economy has, um, has expanded, albeit at a uh, relatively slow rate. Um, and this reflects switches from coal to national, natural gas, uh, more renewable energy um, use, improvements in energy efficiency, and also a slower GDP growth in some of the major carbon emitters. Um, the report also warns that um, if commitments to climate targets begin to wane, um, then this could easily reverse the recent improvements that have been seen. Um, so there is a need for concerted efforts both from the public and private sectors to uh, continue the drive to promote energy inefficiency and promote renewable energy use. Um, and finally, some of the risks and policy challenges highlighted in the report. Um, as we mentioned, tackling poverty is um, going to be a difficult challenge um, in countries where growth remains uh, weak. Um, we need policies that will target both faster medium-term growth and policies to redress inequalities. So in the shorter term, that would um, some, some of the uh, measures that um, would help to address this would be transfer, direct transfers to support consumption amongst the most deprived members of society. Um, but over the longer term, we have to ensure that we broaden access to health care, to education, and improve invest, um, uh, rural infrastructure. Um, the report highlights the heightened uncertainty in the international policy um, arena, which continues to cloud the outlook, uh, which was uh, something that was raised in, in our January report as well. Um, the, there are some major shifts in international policy ongoing, which um, 
leads to a high level of uncertainty and hinders uh, the rebound in global investment that we, uh, that we need in order to put the global economy back on a faster uh, growth trajectory. Um, and uh, we remain uncertain about the prospects for world trade, for development aid, for mi migration, and climate targets in particular. Um, and finally, the report calls for renewed commitments to deeper international policy coordination in key areas of global concern, um, such as aligning the multi multilateral trade trading system with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, expanding official development aid, implementing climate policies, and protection of refugees. And that concludes our key findings of our report. Thank you very much. Done with that, I'll open the floor to questions. If you can state your name and organisation, thank Hi. you. Hi. Yes, uh, Sherman Bryceby, South African Broadcasting, and behalf, on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, always good to get some bad news on a Tuesday morning. Um, I was just looking at, at the numbers for Southern Africa. 1.9% um, in 2015, 0.7% in 2016, 1.8% this year. Clearly, I mean, if, um, comparatively, if, if you look at what's going on in East Africa, I mean, the growth there, 6.7, 5.5, it's just astonishing what the East Africans are doing. So can you sort of just talk about what the differences are? I mean, are you, I know South Africa's there. There's a, you know, a, low, a low base in East African countries, smaller economies, that sort of thing. But also, if you could also talk about, you know, you've mentioned some of the concerns, drought, conflict, but not so much conflict in Southern Africa. So what can Southern African countries do really to get out of this, this, this growth trap? Um, and you also talk about policy uncertainty. How does that apply to the region I'm, I'm, I'm interested in? Um, thank you very much. Um, so, yes, um, Southern Africa is actually one of the regions where we haven't revised down the growth uh, outlook for, uh, for the next two years, but it is also um, the uh, slowest growing region of, of Africa. Um, South Africa obviously dominates uh, the region by economic size. Um, where growth has been held back by uh, a number of factors. So reliance on commodity exports is, is one factor which um, holds back the region. The, uh, the drought also um, had severe impacts in several countries um, uh, in terms of agricultural production. Um, that said, that also impacted, uh, also impacted East Africa where growth is much stronger. Um, one of the, you know, um, the East African countries are coming from a, a, a lower starting base in terms of levels of income. So in that sense, there's a sort of catching up uh, period which, where we would expect and hope to see uh, a more rapid period of growth. So it's, it's just to some extent, that's a sort of normal balance. Um, but uh, the... Um, I think institutional uh, blockages also are uh, um, a, a problem that um, uh, the, uh, several of the southern uh, African economies face, um, which is holding back um, growth prospects and very high levels of unemployment, um, which is extremely difficult to tackle in the, in the short term. It will be a sort of longer term uh, project to, to bring those the unemployment rates um, down, expanding, um, so moving away from over-reliance on uh, the uh, small commodity sectors and broadening, broadening, it, broadening to a wider um, economic base, which could help to redress some of those issues. The, the policy uncertainty you're talking about, though? Oh, uh, policy uncertainty. So the main um, issues in policy uncertainty uh, we highlight relate primarily to uh, policy uh, changes in the large developed economies, so um, changes in, uh, in the United States policy, also changes in, in Europe um, related to uh, renegotiations of... Um, uh, re trade relations, financial market relations, et cetera, related to the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union. Um, some of these have global um, impacts as well. So um, if there's a, a significant um, shift in global trading policy, um, a rise in uh, a unilateral protectionist um, measures, then that would have uh, global impacts 
um, which would uh, be felt um, everywhere. One here, and then please, and then maybe we'll take three at the same time, and I'll come to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, interesting briefing. This is Majid Gili, Ruzao Media Network. I have uh, three questions. Uh, first one I want to ask about the globally. Uh, in the major uncertainties and risk, you talk about how financial markets are still vulnerable. Um, uh, I want to ask you how vulnerable the financial markets are. Are, we, are you expecting um, – is uh, how possible is an economic crisis just like the one in 2008? Did we build any immunity for for that? And the second question is about the Western Asia and Middle East. You're talking about a cautious optimism in the Gulf uh, uh, and oil-rich countries. Um, what's your projection for oil price in the 2017 and 2018? Uh, does that optimism based on realistic expectation or they are just um, – the usual optimism we see in OPEC members, and sometimes it, it's not realized. And the second one, in, in, a third one in Iraq, you talk about uh, um, economic stabilization have started to emerge in Iraq. Can you talk more about that, that economic stabilization? Uh, in the report, it says uh, there are several signs of economic stabilization in Iraq. Um, can you tell me what are those signs, or is it just uh, related to the oil price again? Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take the second question. Thank you. Um, Yoshita Singh with Press Trust of India. Um, India's growth uh, projections have been revised downwards from 7.7 to 7.3 percent. Can you uh, uh, explain as to what led to that uh, downward revision? Uh, how much did demonetization have an impact? Because in the January figures, that wasn't uh, taken into account. And also, um, for next year, it's a 7.9% growth, which is pretty impressive. And so why has that been revised upward for India? Thank you. Thank you. Are you okay if we take the third one, or would you rather address those? We'll take yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Waldo from Prensa Latina. Um, one of the main challenges for uh, LDC's countries in terms of uh, economic growth and in particular for Latin American and Caribbean region. Thank you very much. You need that repeat it. Just repeat that. What, what are the prospects for Latin American and Caribbean region? Yeah. Is that, was that the question? The, the main challenge for ah, LDC's countries and okay. in particular for Latin American and Caribbean. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, Let's start with the major um, uncertainties, um, financial market uncertainties and risks. Is there, how likely are we to see another global financial crisis? Um, we don't think there's a high risk of a global financial crisis emerging in the short term. Um, but what we have seen is um, an, a level of optimism in financial markets, which to date has not been backed up by uh, stronger developments in the real economy. We've seen this marginal uptick in global uh, growth and recovery in global trade, but to date we haven't really seen the uh, developments in the real economy that match the level of optimism that we see in uh, financial markets. Um, so one of the risks that we highlight is that there could be a sudden shift in confidence um, when, it, uh, when these expectations are, are not realized, um, which could then trigger a, um, a, a, a sharp slowdown um, in, the, in the global economy. We don't think that that's not our sort of central forecasts. We don't wouldn't say it's sort of a 40% chance, but it is a, it is a sort of uh, a risk that fate that the uh, global economy faces. Um, but like I say, we, we don't think that uh, we're going to see a global financial crisis in the short term. Um, so the outlook for Western Asia and projections for the oil price. Um, so the oil price, we, what we expect is the oil price to remain volatile. Um, that is, uh, rather than put an actual number on it, we don't expect it to rise uh, to high levels. We, um, for this year and next, um, I would, we have sort of $60 as, as the sort of max that we might expect. Um, 
neither do we expect it to fall to the very low levels that we saw in the um, uh, beginning of last year. Um, but remaining in the sort of 50 to $60 per barrel range is what's anticipated. That is higher than what we saw um, uh, on average for last year. Um, and so that should be bringing some uh, uh, return to growth in um, uh, Western and Asian oil exporting countries. Um, uh, but we also see the, um, the cutbacks in production, which are likely to be extended now until uh, sometime into 2018. So the volume of, uh, of oil production is slightly off, is offsetting to some extent the, the rise in the price. So revenues should be more or less stable, um, but, um, but, our, but we're still, um, that we still, see a strong need to diversify, particularly for the government sec sectors to diversify against, uh, away from over-reliance on oil revenue to, um, to finance the um, fiscal needs. Um, uh, in terms of the signs of economic revival in Iraq, I, 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 I can't give you any specific uh, details on that. Perhaps one of our experts can, uh, can um, enlighten uh, more on that um, after after the briefing today, um, but it will be re reflected in the uh, most recent data that's um, available, which there's minimal amounts of data, so um, uh, it will be stemming from there. Um, on to India, um, so we've so we ha we don't really see that the dynamics of India have shifted very much. So what you, um, what you correctly point out is the uh, uh, slower growth this year and faster growth uh, next year is more a shift in the timing of expenditure, which is largely related to the demonetization policy, which did have an impact um, slowing uh, domestic demand in the, in the short term, but we don't see this as having a longer term impact. It's a sort of transitory effect on the economy as a whole. So it still uh, remains one of the fastest uh, growing countries um, in the world. Um, and what are the key challenges facing the least developed countries? Um, the, uh, as as uh, I think we, we, we mentioned, the high levels of poverty uh, remain uh, a, an enormous challenge um, to redress that. Um, without faster uh, economic growth requires policies that will um, uh, address uh, income inequalities. These are difficult uh, politically to push through um, and um, remain a significant challenge. Um, this is not just a challenge for the least developed countries. I think we should remember that the, the 2030 agenda was something that all the countries signed up to um, the global responsibility to address uh, these uh, issues is there. So it's not just simply a burden that um, is placed on the uh, least developed countries themselves. Um, and finally, a note on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the, the recovery that we were hoping to see towards the end of last year in Brazil and Argentina didn't um, um, uh, emerge as quickly as hoped. We still do see a recovery um, coming uh, um, to those countries uh, this year. Um, but given the weaker starting point, um, we have, we revised down the outlook. So we're not expecting to see a rapid uh, revival. Um, the high unemployment rates are holding the economies back. Fiscal pressures uh, remain, so there's less scope for um, uh, policy, fiscal policy support in the short term to speed the recoveries there. And then Matthew, if you come in, Tess. Thank you. I'm Alex Zelenin with TAS News Agency. Uh, if you could please uh, elaborate a little bit on the effects of the mutual sanctions 
that are in place between Russia, European Union, and the U.S.? How hard are they hitting uh, the economies of the countries? Thank you. And I'll go to Matthew. If you. Sure, uh, Matthew Lee, Inter Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access. Thanks a lot for the briefing on the report. I have two questions. One is, in looking at the at the at, at this, you know, unedited advanced copy, I just wanted to know when I see discussions of, of, for example, inflation in both Egypt and Jordan. I'm covering the IMF too, and they have it's slightly different what they've been saying recently. Like, for example, there was an IMF. Uh, something they put out today saying that inflation is actually down in the country and speaking, they've praised Egypt's work. So I'm just wondering, generally, rather than just on these two countries, what is the relationship between this report and, for example, another part of the UN system, the IMF? Is it, are these two totally different inquiries and where they clash? Like, which one should we believe, according to you? And the other one was, was a sentence about the U.S. Uh, it, obviously, I see the things about policy uncertainty, but th th this, this document seems to say, your document seems to say that, that the policy agenda in the U.S. has some upside potential ex expansionary fiscal policy with an emphasis on infrastructure, you know, could raise private investment and outputs in the short term. I just wonder if you could say more. It seems kind of, it seems the, 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 is, this, is it correct to read this as, as sort of praise or seeing the upside of, of the, of proposals by the current U.S. administration? Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Very much. So, um, uh, what are the effects of sanctions, and how hard are they hitting? Um, so, uh, sanctions um, clearly have some impact. Um, access to international finance has been um, uh, restricted um, in the Russian Federation, which has um, held back uh, the recovery. We do see the economy recovering this year, and one of the things behind that is that. Um, shifts in the production structures, which partly was as uh, it was in reaction to the sanctions. So, looking to replace um, imported goods with deeper um, uh, with domestic production, and that has been quite successful on in some sectors. Um, so, that is um, one of the um, factors behind the uh, projection in the uh, stronger growth for this year. Our forecast, I think, is for 1.5% growth this year. Um, uh, uh, but, um, so, yes, there are impacts, but um, they've been in place for a, an extended period of time now, and the economy has started to sort of grow around them. Um, to accommodate accommodate those. Um, uh, so, on who should we believe, this report or the IMF? That's very easy. Um, as <laughs> um, no, it's it's um, uh, these are completely separate. Um, so we don't um, uh, we don't discuss our projections with the IMF. They don't discuss their projections with us. They're um, we are using the same basic um, information in terms of the data that's underpinning these forecasts. Um, there may have been an extra month of, of inflation data that was released between, um, between when uh, we finalized our forecast numbers and the report that, that they just uh, released, which, um, which could um, explain any discrepancies uh, there. Um, uh, but in terms of the U.S. policy agenda, um, I, without putting any value judgments on whether we are promoting or are, are not promoting, um, we purely um, make the observation that um, uh, if uh, one of the uh, shifts in policy were the introduction of a significant uh, rise in an infrastructure investment that would necessarily raise the rate of growth in the uh, short term. The longer term impacts are harder to uh, assess, particularly because of the potential for um, fiscal sustainability uh, effects. Thank you. And with that, um, that ends today's press briefing. Let me thank our presenters again and also for all of you for joining us today. Thank you.